Hare Krishna. So, grateful to be here to all of you today at the Lotus Feet of the Lordships in there. And uh, we are discussing the Srimad Bhagavatam, the pastime of uh, Ruthu Maharaj and the instructions therein. Now, in this purport, we can see Prabhupada's compassion overflowing. Prabhupada is giving so many important points in the purports. It's like a treasure trove which we need to unearth. So we can only look at some of the points over here, uh, given my finite intelligence and the finite time that we have. So let's. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on three main points in today's class. So first is what is the Brahmanical culture that Prabhupada is talking about. Then second is how the qualities of the Brahmanas preserve that culture. And lastly, we'll discuss how, what role can we play in trying to preserve these higher spiritual values that are the center of Brahmanical culture. So, there's a European philosopher who said, so first is, what is Brahmanical culture? So there's a European philosopher who commented 200 years ago, he says, the problem with the world is that the foolish are cocksure and the wise are full of doubts. <laughs> so, what happens is that if we consider materialistic people, now all of us have some level of materialism within it, that's why I don't want to generalize, but people who have, who, are, who think that there is nothing beyond material life, or even if there is, it's not relevant to me. Either the non-material doesn't exist or it is irrelevant. Now, such people are deeply convinced that if I just get a bigger house, if I just uh, become fitter, if I just earn more money, you know, if I just can do this, that will make me happy. And it is because of that conviction that they have energy. So, in general, we sometimes uh, uh, may think that, oh, in the Rajoguna, in the mode of passion, people are working so hard. And what are they working for? Temporary things. As people work for 16 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours. Nowadays, in some ways, the work from home culture is good because we don't have to spend time commuting. But in other ways, it can be counterproductive because one may never be disconnected from one's work. So, what happens is that the Brahminical culture is meant to remind us that there is a higher purpose to life. Yes, making money is important. We can't survive without money. But more important than making money, or rather making money is important, what we are making with money is even more important. What are we using money for? So, there are valuables and there are values. So the Brahminical purpose, Brahminical culture is meant to remind us that if we want happiness in life, gaining valuables alone is not enough. We need to gain values. Ultimately, without proper values, we, we will not be happy because no matter how much we have, what will happen is we will crave for more and there will always be more to crave for. And that will lead to dissatisfaction. Lobha pravritra arambha karmanama shama spruha rajasyetani jayante vivruddhe kurundha Krishna says that insatiable desire keeps a person rajasastu phalam dukkham that is distressed. That distress may not be a heartbreak or a devastating uh, loss of something. It could just be a chronic sense of dissatisfaction that gnaws us and keeps us um, restless. So, the, the Brahminical culture is meant to remind us that our values, what is it that we truly value in life? What is it that we pursue in life? Our values are more important than the valuables that we may get externally. That the things we have externally, they matter in our life. But the thoughts that we have internally, they matter even more. The world urges us to improve the things that we have. 
but it is only a spiritual centered culture that not only encourages us but equips us to improve our thoughts so what does improving our values and improving our thoughts actually mean it essentially means that we recognize that our essence our spiritual essence we are as souls actually need something more to find fulfillment in life and for that purpose there is in the broad vedic culture there is education then there is culture and then there is ultimately devotion prabhupa talks about these three in the fourth chapter of the bhagavad gita purport has been the first two three verses he emphasizes it quite a bit so the idea is why why these three things specifically education is help uh, is helpful for intellectually reminding us that there is something higher to life the physical dimension is constantly visible to us but and we can see tempting objects we can see disturbing things so that's what actually consumes our consciousness but it's only when we get education when we hear spiritual wisdom uh, hear philosophy then we understand there is something more to life and that something more also matters more than what is visible so that education is vital and that's why we have regular classes that prabhupad wrote so many books and we have a literary culture so that's education and after that culture sometimes the culture may seem a little alien okay is this kind of dress from is it uh, ethnic dress from india is it a spiritual dress is this food spiritual is this food or just cultural but here culture as expressed in this context or what it means is that environment which supports the rising of consciousness just like if we have to take a example from biology we may have yeast culture or a bacteria culture what does that mean that is the place where yeast can grow or bacteria can grow so if it is a spiritual culture it is not just specific externals yes they can be helpful but the more important point is that cultural environment which helps uh, the growth of spirituality so for example food which is very passionate you know which is unhealthy it is tasty but unhealthy that food uh, is not the most conducive for spiritual growth dresses in which one's body is exposed those are going to drag the consciousness down to the material level so that is the cultural aspect and then ultimately there is devotion so so we could say that through education we understand there is something higher through culture we are provided pathways to progress toward the higher but it is devotion that helps us develop attraction to the higher it's like i have a map first i need if i am in denver and say from here i want to go to la first i need a map to go there i need to some have knowledge okay this is here that is there's a place called la that's where i want to go that's education then culture is okay this is the pathway maybe i can go by car maybe i can go by plane so there's a pathway but more important than the education and the culture is devotion in that in this case what means i should have the desire to go to la otherwise both the map and the plane ticket both are not of much use and so the brahmanas brahmanas are brahma janati iti brahmana those who are aware of life spiritual reality not just aware of they live in awareness of life spiritual reality being aware means i know but i don't really care for it i don't uh, really think much about it it's awareness living in awareness that is what this life spiritual side is what matters so brahmanas are expected to provide for all these three things they provide they're supposed to provide education they are the teachers of society and they teach people about life's higher spiritual values and then the culture is they embody the culture they they live purely they they live by by purely we're not talking about puritanical holier than thou attitude but they live, conduct themselves in a way that they demonstrate how to tread the path to higher consciousness and most important now both of these can be there there can be a lot of education and there can also be culture in terms of following the practices but if the heart is not directed to a transcendence then even such brahmanas won't be very effective
In fact, they can be counterproductive. And that is why Prabhupada in the purport mentions ultimately that a Brahmana is one who knows Krishna. Vedaishya Sarvair Ahame Vavedya. Of course, there, were, there, are, there are other forms of uh, worship. There are the devatas that are worshipped. And those who administer that worship are also Brahmanas in one sense. And there are other conceptions of the Absolute. Those who pursue that are also Brahmanas in one sense. But they are not Brahmanas in the fullest sense. So, quite often, Srila Prabhupada connects everything in the scripture with the conclusion of scripture. And that is how we make sure that we don't miss that conclusion. So, this is, so the Brahmanical culture is the social arrangement by which people through education, culture and devotion are inspired to pursue life's higher values, to pursue spirituality. And another part of Brahmanical culture is that Brahmanas will do all this, but society needs to support them. And especially the Kshatriyas support them. The Kshatriyas are the uh, administrators of society, the kings, others. So they are meant to support the Brahmanas. So the Brahmanas don't have to be too worried about worldly things and they can focus on higher pursuits. Now the second part was, okay, so what preserves Brahmanical culture? And here certain qualities are mentioned. So for example, it is mentioned that they are that they are sanyami, that they are restrained. And then there are shraddha, tapo, mangala, mauna, sanyami, samadhina. So these are, so how do the brahmanas maintain brahmanical culture? So it is, brahmanical culture doesn't mean that it is a culture meant for brahmanas. It is a culture meant to pre prepare people to pursue brahman. Brahman is spiritual reality. So it's, it's, and because Brahmanas are vital for this, that's another reason why the word Brahmanical culture is used. But it is not a Brahmana-centered culture in that sense. It is a Brahman-centered culture, spiritual-centered culture. So now, these qualities are mentioned, similar qualities are mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, Shamo, Damas, Tapah, Shaucham, Shanti, Rarjam, Vimucham, Jnanam, Vijnanam, Astikyam, Brahma, Karma, Sambhavacham. So why do these qualities matter? Shraddha is faith. Tapa is austerity. Mangala Mauna. Mangala, I'll elaborate on this. He says auspicious silence. Significant. What do you mean by auspicious silence? Mangala Mauna and Sanyamai. Sanyamai is restraint. Restraint of minds and senses. And then, not just restraint, but Samadhina. We restrain ourselves from the material, but then they're absorbed in the spiritual. Samadhina. And then, by this, what happens is, Darshaye. They're able to see. Artha Darshaye. Artha is value or purpose. So they are able to see the purpose of life. And how clear they can see the purpose is? Adarsha ivavabhasate. Just as if one has a mirror in front of oneself, one can, and it's a clean mirror, then one can see one's face clearly. So it is said, the Brahmanas who have these qualities, they can see the pursue of life, purpose of life as clearly as we may pursue our own face, perceive, not pursue, perceive our own face in a mirror. So actually we need to perceive before we can pursue. So both are related. Uh, now here, Shraddha Tapo Mangala Mauna Sanyame Samadhina. The Brahmanas, what their defining characteristic is the virtues that they embody. These virtues enable them to live in a way that they can lead society. So, Chanakya Pandit says that a Brahmana should not be too close to the king and should not be too far away from the king. And there were in the past, there are broadly you could say two kinds of Brahmanas. Many kinds, but two kinds. One were the Raja Pandits. The Raja Pandits would be the royal priests or the royal scholars. Hmm? They would be in the king's court every day. They would be a part of the king's uh, king's support staff, you could say. Uh, no, the king's uh, advisory board or whatever. And apart from that, uh, the, the Raj Pandits, these are the royal priests. So if you consider the Maha, in the Ramayana, Vashishta Muni was the royal priest of Dashrath Maharaj. He was always there. 
he, he used to then stay in a palace he had his own hermitage but that was within the city very close to the uh, heart of the city and he he was he was serving that family taking care of their needs so needs could be he would provide them wisdom education he would especially perform the ritual sacrifices the name giving ceremony the wedding ceremony and other ceremonies so this is the raj panditas and in the second there can be many intermediaries the second is the forest dwelling brahmanas hmm? so these are the vanachari brahmanas the vanachari can refer to those is a particular stage like we have anaprastha vanachari but vanachari refers to generally one who stays in the forest so the forest dwelling brahmana or the forest dwelling sages sometimes they would be called now what is the difference between the two of them that one of them is in one physically quite close to the king the other is physically far away from the king and both of them would serve different functions in society both of them would help preserve brahmanical culture but both of them would do it differently the raj panditas would be immediately accessible to the king any time there is a issue they could go to raj pandita and ask and in one sense the raj panditas the the royal priests they would be more dependent on the king now whether they got a official salary the way nowadays employers get salary or not that is something which um, requires much more historical investigation i mean generally brahmanas don't draw a salary that's the broad understanding but still they were in one sense maintained directly by the king so while there was accessibility ready accessibility that they also were much more dependent on the king and therefore they could not afford to displease the king too much because if they displease the king there are consequences the immediate consequence would be that their family would starve the king stops supporting them what are they going to do so now even the king was aware of this the kings were also trained to respect the brahmanas at the same time everybody has plans ambitions and somebody comes in the way of that there is going to be annoyance even anger with respect to that so even the ravana when he is contemplating what to do about ram's imminent attack on lanka he has a panel of advisors and unfortunately in that panel the brahmanas who are there have long ago been silenced the brahmanas have been reduced to people who simply perform rituals for him so these were brahmanas brahmanas are meant to worship lord vishnu lord krishna but these are the brahmanas who were performing sacrifices for the defeat of lord ram who was not who was not different from lord vishnu they were performing sacrifices so that ravana would be victorious so this is an example of brahmanas who come too close to the king they lose their brahmanical purpose so they they had that education they had that culture they were performing the rituals but their devotion had been suppressed their devotion was lost and that's that the danger of coming too close to the brahmanas these were called yatudhanas and they were in the past see when we talk about fire sacrifices uh they were less of they were religious but they were in one sense less religious and more technological that yes they didn't they were religious in the sense that they involved chanting of mantras and invoking of higher deities but largely it was technology that means it was a technology is what technology is basically accessing powers to do things which we can't do ourselves the accessing powers latent in nature by which so if i'm speaking now if somebody is not here they can't hear this class but through technology they can see the class on zoom so so the sacrifices were performed just to gain access to higher levels and that's why even the demons would perform sacrifices so these were brahmanas who we could say have lost their independence because of being too close to the king and not being able to do what what is good for the king or in fact they end up doing what is opposite of what the brahmanas meant to do so the other extreme and the other is that this is the danger 
So there's accessibility, but there is there is silence. And this will be not Mangala Mauna. This is Amangala Mauna. Mauna is silence. So now sometimes, okay, this is none of my business. Uh, it says, like some people, you know, you don't poke your nose in others' business. Sometimes you say, some, uh, I was just talking with one devotee and he was telling that, you know, this devotee pokes his nose in everyone else's business. And then I talk with that devotee, he says, that is my business. <laughs> the devotee's idea was that poking my nose in others' business is my business. If there's nothing else to do, if there, what will I do with my life? <laughs> that was that idea. You know, when we talk about gossip, how, how can we define gossip? In many ways, but one way is, well, gossip is when we hear something we like about someone we don't like. <laughs> it's delicious. Oh, now I want to share this with everyone. So what happens is that there are times when this is none of my business. If something bad has happened with somebody, some, even if somebody has done something bad, unless I am either their guide or their authority, I don't have to go about speaking to everyone. So there is time when it's important to maintain silence. Prabhupada says that, for example, Vidura did not tell the Pandavas about Krishna's departure because he said bad news goes on its own and Vidura had come uh, to the Pandavas place here, there primarily to enlighten and deliver Dhritarashtra. And if he had given the news of Krishna's departure, the Pandavas would have been shattered and his energy would have been diverted to pacifying the Pandavas. So there is time when silence is mauna. I mean, so, sorry, silence is auspicious. And mauna is mangala. Even a Brahmana is not meant to uh, be overbearing with the king. He should know that this is the king's jurisdiction. The daily administration is the king's jurisdiction. And a Brahmana should not poke him their head in the Kshatriya's business. There are, you could say, jurisdictions. This is the Kshatriya's jurisdiction, this is the Brahmana's jurisdiction. So the, broadly, the Kshatriya looks after material welfare of the citizens and the Brahmana looks after spiritual welfare. So, but when the Kshatriya is doing something, when the king is doing something which is inauspicious, materially and spiritually, then the Brahmana has to speak. So, one said, so the Brahmanical culture is compromised and lost if the Brahmanas come too close to the Kshatriyas. If the, if the spiritual intellectuals, they come too close to the material administrators. On the other hand, the, uh, so this is where those Brahmanas who are forest dwelling, who are at a distance from the administrators, they have an advantage. Even they, in one sense, are dependent on the king. If the king wants, the king can just send the army and destroy their hermitage. The king can, and that's what sometimes demoniac uh, rulers do that. That's what Kamsa tried to do, Hiranyakashipu tried to do, especially Hiranyakashipu tried to do. So destroy all the, all the, everything related to the Brahmanic culture. Destroy the fire sacrifices, destroy the hermitages. Ravana even devoured, he was a cannibal, he would devour the Brahmanas. So even the Brahmanas who live in the forest are, are in one sense dependent on the king, but not so directly. They are living in the forest, they get most of their subsistence from the forest, they get uh, fruits and roots and other things from the forest. And they can, they just need protection in the case of some aggressors coming over there. So, so these Brahmanas, because they are at a distance from the king, they can give more dispassionate advice. They can even speak strongly when it is required. So, so if, if you go back to the Ramayana, Valmiki Muni's ashram was outside the main city of Ayodhya. And that's why uh, when, Laksh when Lakshman and Sita went, they went in a chariot over there. So, Valmiki Muni lived outside the ashram. Still, it was broadly within Lord Ram's kingdom, but not within his capital, not within his day-to-day -day, uh, area of operation. And when the kings had to make major decisions, major decisions, they would not rely only on their Raj Panditas. They would go to these Vanachari Brahmanas. Why? Because they knew, because their distance gives some perspective. 
they're not dependent so they will give me advice which is which is, which is not not too much tainted by self interest here the word uses yet brahmanityam virajam sanatanam so virajam raja means contamination raja literally means rajas the mode of uh, mode of passion so virajam means not contaminated by the mode of passion not contaminated by immediate concerns it is focused on long term concerns so these brahmanas can give advice based on long term concerns and that's why the kings would go to the sages to hear from them to learn, to inquire from them now the, the the distance and therefore the the, the physical distance and also the we could say the non dependence that came with it that gave them freedom to speak candidly so that was the advantage but the disadvantage is that because they are so far away from the uh, kingdom from the capital at least that their advice could sometimes be impractical because they are not really involved in worldly concerns so that's why it is not that for everyday things the king would consult them it is for major decisions and major decisions also require a long term to implement long time to implement so these two kinds of brahmanas those royal royal priests and the forest dwelling priests both of them would act as a balance so the royal priests would give be immediately accessible and would give advice for some concerns which were which which needed some immediate action and those who were forest dwelling would be more distanced and they would give long term advice so now for both of these this these virtues are important for both of these kind of brahmanas they have to have shraddha that there is a higher reality that i should be pursuing higher that higher reality dharmo rakshati dharma and if i live according to virtue then virtue will protect me tapo that they all have to perform austerity the degree of austerity that a that a sage living in the palace would perform and the degree of austerity a sage living in the forest would perform might be different but if they are not ready to perform austerity what would happen is they will want more and more things and then when they want more and more things they will become more and more dependent so mangala mauna means what to not speak about what to understand that this is not my business that is that is also an important quality of a brahmana and then i see so what happens is no one uh, if you look at the mahabharat also when the pandavas are negotiating with the kauravas and they say just they they are actually entitled to at least half the kingdom but they they say we'll settle for five villages it's interesting the five pandavas were united it's like five fingers they said so the five fingers in a hand work for one purpose the five pandavas would work like that for one purpose and yet these five pa- pandavas did not ask for one village they said five villages everyone needs their space no matter how close we are to someone the five pandavas very close to each other but still each of them needed their space and that's why five villages not one village hmm. so the idea is that mangalam on the kshatriyas need their space and the brahmanas need to give kshatriya their space that's why keep your uh, keep to your business not others business and sanyamayi samadina sanyamayi is again it is restrain oneself and stay connected with spirituality so it is the Bra- it is primarily the brahmanical qualities that preserve brahmanical culture so now of course we can say that there are the support system required the kshatriya should be there supporting that is true but the kshatriyas will be inspired to support the brahmanas when they see that these brahmanas are pursuing something higher and that there is something higher to pursue in life and that's why the qualities are most important if we see buddha was a king a royal prince and he renounced everything and he ate eventually buddhism became hugely influential one the reason for was that for that whereas in those times the priests who were performing rituals they had become quite materialistic whereas this buddhist followers of buddha and his followers this is uh this around a few hundred years before jesus came around 5th century bc is the time when buddha came so actually from 5th century bc to 5th century ad for about a thousand years in indian history large parts of india were ruled by kings who had affiliated themselves with buddhism although the vedic culture was there 
they had affiliated themselves with Buddhism. And why were these kings attracted or affiliated with? Because they saw that the Buddhist monks were actually Buddhist, not, not just monks alone, but the Buddhist, Buddhist sages, Buddhist followers. They were actually living a detached life. They were actually pursuing something higher. So the Kshatriyas will be inspired. The Kshatriyas have greater material power. Why would they submit to someone who has lesser material power than them? Far lesser material power than them. It is only when the Kshatriyas are convinced that there is something higher than material power. And these people have that. So the Brahmanical virtues are what are vital for the, for the preservation of Brahmanical culture in society at large. So now that was the second part. So what preserves Brahmanical culture? How is Brahmanical culture preserved? And what damages is the Brahmanas become compromised. Either they don't speak the truth because they are too dependent on the king or they speak truth that is so impractical that the king feels that these people, I can't learn anything from them. So, so now the last part is how does this apply to all of us? So broadly speaking, Srila Prabhupada started the Krishna consciousness movement because he wanted he wanted to revive in one sense Brahminical culture. Initially he said that I have come looking for Brahmanas. What he meant by looking for Brahmanas? It is not that he wanted to convert people to a caste system. Prabhupada was strongly against that. Completely against that. But that meant that those people who are spiritually inclined, those people who have the who have the who have the values, who have the culture, who have the background from this and previous lives, to pursue spiritual uh, things in life. He wanted to train them. He wanted to create a forum for them. And eventually, of course, Prabhupada wanted the whole social organization centered on Varanashram, where there were people who were not so spiritually focused. And they would also be accommodated within Prabhupada's system. In India, Prabhupada's followers were mostly life members. And those life members were not serious, serious, serious seekers. They were not really chanting 16 rounds every day. But Prabhupada accommodated. So the point is that Prabhupada did want Brahmanas. So what does it mean that these three things, again, if you go back, education, culture, and devotion. So each one of us in our particular area of influence, we try to gain education and we try to share that education with others. So it, can, it means we study scripture, we hear the car, and we talk with others, whatever opportunity we get in an appropriate way. And we try to raise people's consciousness. And it's important that we raise our own consciousness, raise the consciousness of devotees also around us. Because sometimes, because our movement is functioning in the material world, our movement has a transcendental purpose, but it is functioning in the material world. So, in the material world, things can always go wrong. And you can say it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. They will go wrong. So then, sometimes what may happen is, that even we may get too consumed by the material upheavals in our moment. And then we may forget that actually I am here for a spiritual purpose. So Krishna is reciprocal. If we come to Krishna, whatever Krishna is like a kalpataru, he is like a desire fulfilling tree. So what we come to Krishna for, that's what we will get. So if somebody comes to Krishna's movement for respect, well, in which other organization you go, you just go and everybody bows down to you. It doesn't happen so easily, <laughs> isn't it? If somebody wants respect, they're just around for a few years, they'll get a lot of respect if they want to. Hmm? If somebody wants money, if somebody tries to serve Krishna, well, money can also come. If somebody wants controversy, they'll get controversy also. Lot more controversy than maybe even in the material world. <laughs> So we can get wealth, we can get followers, we can get fame, we can get various material things. We can get controversy and we can get Krishna also. That is something which we will not get anywhere else. But it depends on us. So if we start, if within the material upheavals that will inevitably happen in the spiritual movement, if we get too caught in them, if the education, culture and devotion are not proper within us, we will get too affected by the material upheavals. And then we will not be able to attain Krishna. We will be in Krishna's movement, but we will be looking at things other than Krishna in the moment. We are looking uh, now. We may have to look uh, if there are some controversies. Those who are in authority need to resolve the controversies. But everybody doesn't have to become consumed by the controversies. So, what we can do is through 
whatever level is capable possible for us through our education through our culture by culture i broadly mean the way we conduct ourselves and through the direct devotional practices which increase our attraction to the lord we try to focus ourselves on spiritual values and if we do that then we will stay connected with krishna not only stay connected become increasingly connected with krishna and will inspire others also to become increasingly connected and that is the way ultimately to not only preserve brahmanical culture but to fulfill the purpose of brahmanical culture prabhupad says in the bhagavad gita introduction that even if one person becomes a pure devotee he says i by purpose of writing the bhagavad gita will be fulfilled and of course it's not, even if people don't even if we say i am very far away from becoming pure devotee even if i am progressing towards that there is a beautiful letter of shri prabhupad where he says i am never displeased with any member of iskon i am pleased that you are at least a member of iskon <laughs> that is the implication so prabhupad said that he was at whatever level we connect with him prabhupad is happy of course prabhupad wants us to rise higher and higher and the, is provided as resources to rise higher and higher in our consciousness But to the extent we we keep that spiritual purpose in mind then to that extent what will happen is we will also be able to understand adarshate he said you know that abhasat adarsha abhasate uh, iva abhas iva abhasate sorry iva bhasate so what will happen is okay in this particular situation what am i supposed to do should i get caught in this controversy should i neglect it should i just move somewhere else what should i do how should i pursue the purpose of my life that will become clearer for us if we focus too much on the materials material con- material issues then what will happen is oh this is wrong here and that is wrong there and that is wrong there now we will never find any perfect place in the material world and if there were a perfect place in the material world and if we found such a place you know we wouldn't be allowed entry because we are not perfect so to some extent we need to choose our battles and when we try to educationally culturally and devotionally stay centered on spiritual spirituality then how to navigate our circumstances and how to continue moving toward krishna that knowledge will arise from within that our own education culture devotion will become like that mirror in that we'll see okay this is what this is what this is where i am at this is where i need to go and that's dadami buddhi yogam tam ye namam apayantite krishna will give us the intelligence from within by which we can keep progressing towards him so i'll summarize i spoke broadly on brahmanical culture today so i started by what is brahmanical culture it is not a culture centered on brahmanas but on Brahm, the brahman the pursuit of brahman and that is required because material pursuits will leave us dissatisfied and that there are higher things to pursue in life that is embodied primarily by the brahmanas and it is provided by society through education Uh, that is like giving a map to know there is another place i can go to then culture is like providing the path to go there and then devotion is kindling a desire for going to that higher place so the, so the, how is this brahmanical culture preserved broadly by two kinds of brahmanas those who uh, stay close to the king and they advise the king on immediate affairs but they are they are often somewhat dependent on the king and there are brahmanas who stay away from the king in the forest because of the distance they are less dependent and they can give advice with greater candor but it might be impractical so the balance of these two brahmanas uh, and they are both embodying brahmanical virtues by which they show that they are living for something higher than the material that is what inspires the those who have material power to submit themselves to So, so this is how brahmanical culture is preserved and lastly i discussed about what can we do in whatever situation we are in we try to internalize education culture and devotion so that we stay spiritually centered and we keep moving toward krishna whatever happens in the broader world or even in the devotional world around us we stay as a positive influence and we inspire others also to be positively purposeful in moving toward krishna thank you very much hare krishna Are there any comments, reflections, questions? Yes, please. You spoke about how the royal Brahmins are 
give the guys some more stuff. And then if the water is flooding, we found more of them. More of them are maybe here, but we think it's not that it's found in the Is it that see the Brahmanas who are living in the cities are more self interested and the Brahmanas living outside are more objective? Well, I won't put it that black and white. I said that there's plus and minus, and it's not just self interested. You could say that. Uh, and nobody going to be completely self uninterested even as i said the brahmanas who are outside also they don't want to antagonize the king unnecessarily so in the material world there is no no perfectly positive thing every positive comes with negative or or that you know we won't get any perfect arrangement we just get the arrangement with the least intolerable trade off <laughs> with the least intolerable trade off okay i get this but i lose this over here so we are, there's always a trade off but okay this is this is okay this is both trade offs are bad but this is less bad among them it's like that so the point is that uh, those uh, those who are close to the king uh, they they are also while they have immediate they have their worldly concerns you could say maybe their worldly concerns are more than others but there is also an awareness of the dynamics of how a state works and therefore their advice is also more realistic so that's why i hesitate to use the word self interested and objective for the two categories so there is uh, their advice is likely to be more pragmatic realistic but it is also likely to be more you could say as you said self interested or more motivated more uh, personal with their very greater personal motivation uh, but uh, but on the other hand the forest dwelling sages they they may not be so much personal interest at stake for them but there not be much practicality in their advice mm -hmm. so yes now would that apply to our moment also yes to some extent that is true that uh, if someone is someone may be an intellectual somebody be a scholar but they are directly a part of the institutional machinery of the moment mm -hmm. then generally institutions are conservative conservative means not necessarily the values are always conservative but institutions always work to conserve themselves and that's not wrong that have propa said keep the wheels moving so that's required but how far can we go to conserve so when in our movement's history book distribution just stopped because of the various reasons then devotees started selling incense and uh, drawings and other things like that uh, okay but was that what shri prabhu started the movement for so how far does one go in that direction so that's a question which so the institution wanted to preserve itself and that was that was good preserving itself but how far does one go for that that's something just to be considered so those who are involved in the institutional machinery they they because of both having greater immediate concerns and greater immediate awareness it is difficult for them to suggest radical changes now those who are a little away from the institutional machinery they can they can see with greater you could say a bigger perspective but then they may not realize the challenges that they will have, that if somebody has to implement this what are the challenges they will have to face so if i am a part of the back to god editorial team so we have been discussing for many years how we can make the back to god magazine more relevant more appealing and more reachable propad wanted it to be like uh, in india there was illustrated weekly and times there are very reputable papers propad had let, let us i want this magazine to become like that so almost all the like uh, those devotee scholars who are not directly connected with the movement their academic scholars more aware of the contemporary world one of the suggestions they have all given is that you have to change the name back nobody in today's world it is first of all god has itself become not such a popular name you know in star wars if it says this of may the force be with you this may god may god be with you all the theaters would become empty <laughs> so and godhead is a godhead is even more abstract word 
So they said that if you want this magazine to be relevant, it has to begin with the name. Now that is in one sense valid. But within ISKCON, this is the name that Prabhupada gave to back to God. So when we suggested this to somebody, they says, well, tomorrow what are you, where are you going to stop? You we should say, change the name ISKCON also. Because this Prabhupada says ISKCON is too religious. We don't want Krishna in the name. So, you know, that, that's, that's a challenge. There's no, I wouldn't say one side is right and the other side is wrong. But it's difficult to implement. So somehow there has to be a discussion and a balance will come in. Yes, in some cases, those who are detached, they, can, they may be able to give better advice. But it may not necessarily be better in terms of its, its, its applicability. Now, what is the good use of good advice if it is, if it is too good to be applied by those for whom it's intended? Okay. So, any other comments, questions? Yes, where is the name of the Where is that? Like, uh, that uh, yeah. What is Tilak for? Okay, what is Tilak for? Yeah. Well, at a very uh, there are multiple levels of understanding this. One is that it is a it is a cultural identifier. Those who are devoted or practicing in this tradition, every tradition has its identifiers in terms of dress or some particular. I mean, so this is a cultural identifier. From a more spiritual perspective. This indicates the foot of God. So we are placing the foot of God on our head, which suggests that we are accepting him as our master and we are his servants. Hmm? From a more practical perspective, the tilak, it is made of a particular kind of clay, which is very soothing and cooling. So applying it can help us to keep a cool head. There is a lot in the, <laughs> lot in the world which can make our head hot. <laughs> this can keep our head cool. Okay. Thank you. Any comments now? Please. Thanks for doing well for that. Thank you. Good to be here. So, this is the um, translation is explaining that um, the drama movement. Okay, yeah. So, how can understanding Prabhupada better help us have greater faith in his books? Yes, this is a, a huge issue for deliberation in our moment. I'm a part of the Shastrik Advisory Council and we have published an elaborate paper and course on hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is basically how do we understand scripture? In this case, how do you understand Prabhupada's books? Because See, generally, if you read Prabhupada's books, there is so much wisdom and it's sound. And in many ways, it works if we practice it. We see changes in our life. So both in terms of its logical soundness and its practical effectiveness. It is, it is powerful. So by reading Prabhupada's books itself, we can get more and more faith in Prabhupada. At the same time, during reading Prabhupada's books, there are certain statements that we will come across which can come off as, uh, as not only just objectionable, but sometimes for some people unbearable. Statements which arise from uh, statements about say particular demographic groups, so statements about particular cultural actions and things like that. And that is what might destabilize people's faith. So for this, that's why it is, there is an achar and there is prachar. There is Prabhupada's example and Prabhupada's teachings. And there has to be a synergy between the two of them. We look, we understand Prabhupada's teachings better by looking at how he lived those teachings. And we look at, we understand Prabhupada's uh, life better through his teachings. So there is the achar and the prachar. Now, if we look only at the prachar, so for example, Prabhupada sometimes makes statements like, say women are less intelligent. And that can be outrageous for people in today's world. 
But if you look at how people, Prabhupada conducted himself, now he never made any anyone feel, any woman feel less intelligent. I was talking with His Holiness Giriraj Maharaj and he said that I heard every single one of the sound bites that are available with Prabhupada says such things, says these things. This is not one, not in one of those, because Giriraj Maharaj is probably the only person on the planet, the person on the planet who has spent maximum time with Prabhupada. So he said, I knew the nuances of Prabhupada's voice. I knew the way Prabhupada would speak. He says, not once did I notice any sign of derision or condemnation in what Prabhupada was saying. So he said, my realization is that when Prabhupada is saying women are less intelligent, he's not saying it to put women down. He often compares women with children and children need to be protected. He says, he's saying this to men, again, not for men to put women down, but for men to come forward and take the responsibility as men for doing their role in society, which includes protecting women. So this is a very different understanding from what we might get by simply by reading the words. And similarly, there are many other uh, other things which we come to know from the context. So recently one devotee came to me and he's very disturbed. He says, oh, he's from a Jew background. And he said, Prabhupada says, Prabhupada said that Hitler is not such a bad person. It is the Britain where the British with their publicity they spoiled him. So he said, how could Prabhupada say something like this? He's extremely disturbed. And I can understand his, his great grandparents were both sides were killed in the Holocaust. So then I explained to him that Prabhupada said there have been great demons like Ravana, Hiranyakashipu, and Prabhupada includes Hitler in that list. So those are the, so those are the statements also that Prabhupada has made. But why has so we say still why did Prabhupada make a statement like that? So for that again we need context. The Prabhupada lived most of his life in Bengal. He was from Bengal. And in the 1940s, when the Second World War was at its peak, that time one of the worst famines in the history of India happened. And estimates vary between 1 million to 3 million people were killed. And this famine was not caused by nature. It was caused by British mismanagement. So what happened was, Japan was attacking from the east and British realized we don't have the defense forces. So they followed what is called, called a scorched earth policy. That means they just burned all the grains available over there. So that the Japanese wouldn't have the grains. And then they would have to wait for food supply and their progress would be checked. But in that process, all the Bengali natives, they were left with no food. And then on top of that, what they did was, whatever grains were available in other parts of India, instead of giving it to Bengal, where there was such famine and starvation, they shipped it to other parts of the world where British troops were fighting. And then after that, the, and as the famine became, people were literally dying on the streets because of lack of food. And then there was, uh, then the Indian governor general, he was no great lover of India, but at least he had some humanitarian concern. He said, people are dying. There are ships going with, uh, with uh, grains filled. They're coming from Britain and Europe and they were going towards to supply the British forces in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, no, in the Indian Ocean. He says, stop some of the ships and provide some food. So Winston Churchill says, nothing doing. He says, he said, actually told him that people are dying. So Churchill's reply was, if people are dying, why has Gandhi not died till now? Because he's considered Gandhi to be basically a pest. Because Gandhi was obstructing his rule. So at that time, India saw the utter brutality of the British. And at that time, what had happened? See, India, that, that time, what the Holocaust was not known. Even Churchill and other leaders of the Allies, it's only after the war ended and they saw the Holocaust, they realized how terrible it was. So from the Indian perspective, British were terrible. And from the Indian perspective, what happened was that what the Germans were doing wrong was not known. And because the Germans were opposed to the British, there are some Indian leaders, Subhash Chandra was especially, he allied with the, he allied with the Germans. So many Indians at that point, saw the Germans, the Germans could be our potential liberators from this brutal British rule. And Germans had also adopted some kind of Indian terminology. They used the word Aryan, they had swastik, although they distorted it. So the point was, and Subhash Chandra Bose and Prabhupada went to the same school, same college. And so there was that context in which Prabhupada made certain statements. He said that Hitler was not such a bad person, it was the British who spoiled him. 
So now, is this Prabhupada speaking the absolute truth? If we ask Prabhupada, Prabhupada wouldn't have claimed that it was the absolute truth. Based on the cultural context he was in, he spoke certain statements. So we have to help devotees that there is content and there is context. So content cannot be understood solely on its own. We have to look at the content in its context. And that is why understanding Prabhupada is important to understand his words. Otherwise, words alone, which are meant to help us come towards Krishna, may make us think, do I really want to go towards Krishna? And that could become a problem. So that's one take which I have that uh, on your point that we need to understand Prabhupada to better understand his words. And Prabhupada's life can help us see in what context Prabhupada said those words. Does that address your question? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Malimata Jihani comments. You have any comments, Mataji? No, comments, I think. Um, I really appreciate your class. I appreciate the also distinction you made. And I, I really appreciate the also distinction you made and the message of the, the, the one about the different type of problem that was very enlightening for me. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things in, in society, like spiritual society, we think about the king and all that, of course, he was spiritual. Uh, might be at the same time, and I was in spiritual society, Christian, you know, Catholic Church, and East Constitution, and all that, and, and warehouses, Brahmanas that are dwelling just outside of the society, and warehouses, Brahmanas are dwelling far away enough to be the one who go back to. And I was wondering was that. And then another question I had is uh, about, you know, we, we speak about unsolicited advice. So in a, in, a, in a term of drama is dharma, I imagine that they were not doing unsolicited uh, advice, that they will only you know, focus on Krishna, and then when the king will come to them, that's when they will like, advise them. And that they, you know, that's what I was wondering, how they you know, proactively advise or only, only focusing on Krishna, and when the king comes to them, then they share what they have to share. That's yeah, okay. And, and, and thank you, I've been fascinated by the whole session presentation. Thank you. I'm going to give a service. Two things with respect to unsolicited advice. In one sense, you could say all preaching is unsolicited advice. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. It is we who are going and giving books to people. <laughs> <laughs> So it is. So in one sense, it is. We could say we are in the business of giving unsolicited advice, but there is a way to do that, where it's not that we put ourselves in holier than the opposition. We, Prabhupada also wanted us to develop personal relationships. Prabhupada says the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by the sixfold loving exchanges. He says in the the Dati Pratikranati verse, the nectar of instruction. So the idea is that we are not just telling people what to do. We are. In, we are inviting them to join a, a loving, welcoming community where they will be naturally inspired uh, to move toward Krishna. So, 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 that, so, instead of using the word, I would say unsolicited advice. I mean, because it's very difficult to decide what is solicited, unsolicited, in one sense. But there has to be a basic understanding of human nature and human psychology. See, some people are, are, all, are more welcoming towards advice. Some people may be less welcoming towards advice. So then accordingly, the Brahmanas also have to adjust. If a person is welcoming, then even, even without being solicited, somebody can give some inputs. But if some people like, touch me not, then okay, in this case, well, maybe this is not where I can contribute the most. So I would say it will depend on individual, individual kings or individual administrators also. And as far as our movement and those who are sort of on the fringes uh, or slightly at a distance, well, a lot of a lot of positive changes in our movement have happened from the fringes. In one sense, Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj did a lot of contemporary outreach, and he did that because because of the various history of Nirvana and other things. For some time, he was outside the movement, and that's how he started IFAST, and he reached to a lot of influential people, and he. 
was quite non-conservative in the kind of dresses he would wear and the kind of ways he would approach. So that has had its advantages. Uh, even uh, in general, if there is uh, too much oversight, then there cannot be a lot of resourcefulness about what can be done. So that's a challenge. And uh, if, if basically those who are a little bit at a distance from the moment, they, a, they can be resourceful. Okay, this is what needs to be done, let's do it. So much of, there is a significant amount of bhakti outreach that is happening through yoga, that is happening through coaching, that is happening through Ayurveda and health. There is all this is happening, but all this is happening, you could say at the fringes of the movement. And that is good because we don't want our movement simply to be about coaching or yoga or Ayurveda. Hmm? We, our movement is about Krishna, but these can open pathways toward Krishna. So the idea is that uh, at the fringes, there can be a little more innovation. The word innovation has a negative connotation, but Prabhupada said that in, you know, we need to think of new ways to attract people toward Krishna, new ways to provide people pathways to connect with Krishna. So that will usually happen at the fringes. So if the fringe does not constantly criticize the core, you know, you people are doing nothing. So as I said, the core is going to be uh, the, I mean, the core is not the right word. The, the, the center, the, uh, the administrative center of the movement is going to be conservative. The order that the administrative periphery of the movement can be more, more radical, can be more innovative, can be more resourceful. In, in dealing with contemporary challenges and coming up with contem and tapping contemporary opportunities. But if both recognize their role and both don't criticize each other, if the, if the administrative center, they are constantly criticizing, you know, this person is whimsical, this person is going off, this person is going off, then people will lose the spirit to try something new for Krishna. On the other hand, if those who are doing new things, if they start criticizing those who are continuing the goal, then who, who is going to continue the core, core practice is also important. So that's why Anya Ninda Dishunya, one of the characteristics of Vaishnavas is to avoid criticism of others. So it doesn't say that Anya Ninda Dishunya Ipsita Sangalabdhya. It's not that they don't criticize others. It's that they don't have the tendency to criticize others. Yeah, the propensity to criticize others. So if they can avoid, then both these can play valuable roles in the future of our moment. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupad ki, Vantraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Gaur Bhaktavinda ki, Tai Gaur Premanande.